his work, I had never seen his work hard so it just opened a whole lot of work and it was just it wasn't far, it was quite astonishing, just he did the interior. Yes, yeah, it was quite beautiful. And, but we got to go and see a whole bunch of buildings, and, and that was the early 70s. It was renovated, and all of that. I never finished it. Eventually, I sold cars. I sold new and used cars at Calvary.
from my heart um, because we are on unceded territory of the nations um, and also from my heart I want to thank all of you for coming because we really truly believe that design makes a difference in the world and I hope that all of you believe that too um, this is it's just part of our tradi tradition of design so thank you and here's me Especially a lot of friends from the past and some recent friends that I met last week <laughs> on a tour around the courthouse of Simon Fraser, a student's uh, uh, lesbian's class. That was fun. That was fun. That was a bit, it was a good, it's an interesting time to go back to those things and reminisce and see how and why they all happen. So it's, uh, as you get older too, that becomes even more important. Um, Tonight, we'll be talking about this fellow here. Uh, and it's, it's a building, you know, that's one of Arthur's most prominent, recognizable, and one that I, I, I liked a lot, because I told Arthur once, it's, uh, it feels it's favorite to me because it's like your first sketch, it's off the hand. It's not overworked. It's direct. It's simple. And I thought that's the freshness of this thing right to, today. Well, not anymore because it's not there anymore. But anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so that was always why I enjoyed the building. And I was also a young architect getting into the field. I just started working in the office with some of my other colleagues like home. And uh, so we were watching this and grew up in that atmosphere. Museum. There was a collection that was being held in the library, basement of the library, by the Hawthorns, Audrey and Harry Hawthorne, who, in, you know, collected, uh, or, or they were actually caretaking some of the pieces from all peoples from the Northwest Coast, uh, First Nations. And in sort of the early 70s, 71, they approached Arthur. You know, to see, I guess, we, I get, I'm sure, to design the building, but also they wanted to ask him for some, if he could reach out to the federal government for some funding. Which Arthur had some contacts at that time, because Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister. And so they got, they got a funding, they got a fund, which is about $3.1 million dollars to do this. And this is a 69,000 square foot building, so. It's, it's a bit uh, interesting. Uh, UBC provided the site, and it was a site on the top of the uh, sandstone bluffs, and uh, it stepped up gently up to the up to the marine drive, or considered a scenic drive. And, and on the way up there, there's a series of three gun emplacements that were built in for the Second World War, and they. Uh, so that stuff, and, and, and then really, you know, in Arthur, a lot of his work he did in this way, where really the site considerations and the planning of some of the impetus for the site was first. You know, he did that for most of his buildings, especially the houses that I ended up working on. So really, the site plan evolved from, from his ideas of the, of the edge, the view from the edge of the, uh, the same sea and mountains behind. And then he uh, thought it'd be interesting to pull, uh, to make the building too like it's sitting on the on the mainland, 
And it was really a, uh, something that he remembered from a photograph he saw from, I think, of a higher village upon uh, Bayer Island. And he, saw, he thought the organization of the beach, or the sea, the beach, where the, native, the First Nations people lived, and then the forest backing it. So the whole the story of the building is about that. And, and, and then you know, up to Marie Ryan, which is a scenic drive, and I think at that time they also said, well, the building has to be low. You can't interfere with that. But on the way up to the scenic drive, there are three gun emplacements. And uh, so he has the landscape concept in his mind to set the building up. But then he comes across these three gun, gun, place, gun emplacements. And uh, <laughs> where's my uh, slide advancer? <laughs> okay. And I don't know if they were ever fired, but uh, you know, they're just the, the spaces that were, you know, as you study the site, we. Really, it was decided, he decided the best place for the building was to strand the gun in places because they were massive concrete forms and would cost a fortune just to eliminate them at that time. And if you put the building in front of the gun places, you're close, too close to the bluff, you put it behind the gun emplacements on your foreground. So the building, uh, they straddled the bluff and it's, uh, the, you know, they're not noticeable, the middle one is, you won't, you won't know as a gun emplacement, but the photo on the at the bottom there's Bill Reed sculptures, Hyder's uh, uh, story or myth of creation, the raven of the first humans. It was kind of, it was fun to play that article because here's this thing about life sitting on something that's about well, death. <laughs> and it's kind of strange, but anyway, he made uh, interesting news. So the, and the whole building. Um, the whole building was designed as a process from the entrance, and it's sort of an emerging out of the forest uh, down to the to the beach. And really, the the, the first three I always thought was the first three uh, arcades or the uh, bees were always they're like the introduction to a symphony of what's going to happen and the modulation of shapes and forms and spaces. And then it, through that led you to the entry, and then down the entry you go through a series of three small galleries in between that uh, were really uh, initially, you know, I don't know what's happened since, but initially they were a, sort of uh, reflective of the three sort of groupings of nations of the south coast, the middle of the coast, the Quark River, and then the north coast, the Haya and Sinshin and the others. And so they, they each galleries that showing that. They were sort of uh, more almost subterranean, but in the sky that's uh, washable and not far. And then you, you, know, you go through these low spaces, and then you explore it into the Great Hall. And that's where the, uh, the large carvings, the massive carvings, you know. And uh, the plans for that. Uh, so I go back where I, this was uh, finished on the four o'clock, so. But um, yeah, there was a, the, the sketch, Arthur, I had the original sketch of Arthur's on that one. That one, okay. So this is an Arthur sketch, and he, he showed up on the floor, and he was working on this. And then you just throw it at one of the young architects and say, here, it will be this floor plate model, please. And he's got, if you look at it carefully, you know, it's hard to read, I know, but all the elevations are set, because he works from contour models right away, he wants it. And then, uh, but all the little writings, and the, the exhibit was organized at this scale. There's no roof on this plate. There's nothing. And then even the notion of the forms started to happen. You know, so the building really was, you know, it's, it's facing the inward, and, um, 
uh, in those are the main features that guide the development of the, the galleries work from there to the Great Hall, then there's a small gallery that uh, dropped off toward the bottom, bottom of, the, of the drawing that was a, a fine craft, you know, jewelry and things like that, but like much more soon. And there were in glass cases. <coughs> that, that's good. That in glass cases, that, uh, they were just the finest stuff. It was really nice. It was really close to them. They were right next to um, the, the uh, trees, there's a grove of trees on the side. So there was a nice connection on glass wall. The Great Hall structure was to happen, and that was uh, an interesting. He, he wasn't sure what to, uh, how to approach that. At first, he thought it'd be nice. He wanted, as the explosion, he had more spaces to go into a space of clear daylight. He, he thought the large toilet should be as they were on the beach, or in front of the high houses, or any of them. And uh, he, so he, the first thought. To do a greenhouse with a steel structure, but that is uh, too busy. It's not the structure. The steel structures can get busy and get fine, but they they would really distract from the large gardens that were to be housed in there. And then he decided the in situ concrete was the right way to go. And the inspiration for that came from the Montreal house structure. That uh, but he, these are his words now, he made the use of enormous split cedar logs and an exaggerated, luxurious effect. I felt that a similar, similar ponderous weight and disregard for structural reality could contain. The engineers laughing, yeah. I bought the Vicky didn't think so, you know. And, so, so we went through, there was a series of audience studies that he went through, the orchestra, I was in the office, but I wasn't fully working on this building, I was working on a house and other things. And uh, this is one of the models that was built, it was on a basswood that was built in our model shop. <laughs> and uh, it was really, really studying the, for the heights of the building and all that relative to the, the the totems that was our group, sort of uh, showing on the totems, and just dolls to get the heights of the structure that it had to be. And he was, uh, in the, the structure was a visual design, you know, because all the columns were the same size, whether they were 20 feet high or 50 feet high. And then they were one foot eight, and six feet long and ranged from 20 feet to 50 feet. And the, and the channel beams were the same dimension. The channel beams were six, in, six feet high and six feet wide. And they were spanning from a distance of 35, 36 feet to 160 feet with the same dimension. Um, but I think Bold was quite exasperated with this exercise. <laughs> the structural engineer, Bold, he was very good. And uh, he... Um, when Arthur was working from another end, he thought, he thought that the, there's a... The, the same dimension of the column and beam, Arthur felt that it was... He learned that on the first part of the Smith house, in the second part of the house, where the columns and the beams are the same size. And he, and he said that it was a sort of a... The, 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 the defining the structure and the reality of columns and beams are a mixture of calm and tension. I recalled the early dark temples of Athens. And this is a well-traveled fellow that um, had a lot of visual experience. And, and so these are some of the guiding things that the Paul was trying to work with. And, and so Paul didn't eventually, when it, and it was impossible, he couldn't stand it to and it's 160 feet. So in, in exasperation, Paul spanned the great hall the other way, from top 
problem. So the fact of being that runs the, uh, through the new channels is really the one that's carrying the load down the back to the solid wall. And, uh, which is, you know, I think it's really tough, you know, just kind of get through these words here, but in collaboration, he thought that it gave a subtle cross rhythm to the uh, strong ascending beat of the beams and calls, ambiguous enough to give, to give a subtle, wonderful mystery to the great law. So he was, he was the book was kind of being an engineer, and Arthur was being an artist. <laughs> so they were dancing a little bit differently, which is kind of fun. So our consulting team, um, this is just a preamble to give you a sense of what we have, what the, what the meaning of the project is that we have to deal with. We were basically uh, brought on to uh, do the select We were to do the structural upgrade of the Great Hall and really an envelope upgrade to the whole building. And the, the other initial part was also to find a new theater. Because the theater that was in the museum was taken over with a new master of this gallery. So they had to find a new, a new place. But it was a, but it used to be a multi-purpose theater. And that was an interesting exercise in itself, but it's a little bit too long to go into at this time. Our team, you know, the stakeholders for the project were UBC Project Services. And campus planning, uh, more staff, and a membership, Western First Nation, whose land the buildings of uh, Breast Sun, AEF, Arthur Exit Foundation, over your interventions to AE Works, and the pub. And also, our work was all added by the next that was written in particular to the Great Hall and the museum, which really took care of all the architectural, you know, the, the defining elements of the buildings. So, those were the things that we had to work with. Um, with our, our team, our, well, our, our key member to our team, who uh, um, is Eric Karsh from Equilibrium, who's here tonight, he'll be speaking to the structure a bit. And he, uh, we chatted about, you know, joining up to do this, and uh, he, he said, oh yeah, and he said, you know, I was really still in base isolation. I said, what's that? And he said, well, you need easy. You just go under the, you dig under the building, you cut the column, and put it in an isolator. And you rub it and steal the wounds, or dampens the shock of the earthquake. I said, that sounds pretty easy. So let's, let's get on. So we decided to work together. And, uh, but it was, uh, you know, he, he knew instinctively that this thing was work. In the, in the new current uh, codes and all that. It, it, you know, that's the only way. And actually, he said this to me, he said, that's, that's the only way to try to save the dimensions of this building as they are. He said, otherwise, the columns would get heavier, everything would change, and then it's a different place. So, from the, you know, as we got into it, so Eric you know, was a structural consultant, and we also had a structural consultant from uh, working on all the glass. We had to do that, all the glass upgrades too, and uh, especially the vertical glass in the Great Hall. Uh, it was a pair from San Francisco. We had, you know, uh, integrals are mechanical consultant, and AES is our electrical consultant. This included in the upgrade where, you know, the, light, the lighting was upgraded significantly in this building. So, like, this evening is really about not those other things, but just the, the upgrade, the structural upgrade. Um, the, the existing Ray Hall had 10 columns marching on either side of the space, and they rested basically on, uh, on, on footings. And there's a, a, a slab that spanned between them that tied everything together. 
Um, but this, this, that was obviously you had to all be interfered with in some way or another. The, so one of the things that right off the beginning really sort of jarred everyone was that the ABC was doing some uh, investigation, seismic investigation to many of the buildings out there. And uh, they found the Great Hall. One of the evaluations that it was about 25% of what it should be for this uh, currently. And the other one said, it would come down early in you know, a seismic event. So everyone was very lucky we didn't have one because uh, there wouldn't be anything there, including the exhibit center. One of the engineers said, so, you know, the people might not be there, but the uh, exhibit for you and all that is there 24 7. And of the, of the, uh, of the, of the structure, the most vulnerable were the late views. Let me, I'll bring in Eric to speak a little the structure and how it works. Uh, so he can lead you to some of the components and uh, what they do, and then we'll get into how we try to fix it. Thanks, Nick. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, it's truly been an honor to work on this iconic uh, building, uh, especially that it is uh, one of those buildings where the structure really is the architecture. Um, and as Arthur Harrison put it, even at a time when codes didn't worry about seismic at all, this was a building where uh, the architect didn't want to worry about the structure altogether. So, <laughs> It, it is it is a structure that is unbelievably slender. Um, uh, the, the columns are very slender. The spans are large, um, and then you wrap it in glass, put it in a seismic zone, and you have a, you have an issue. <laughs> so uh, when Nick asked me to to uh, give him some thoughts as to how we could seismically uh, protect this building, uh, it, you know we, we we chatted back and forth, but it became pretty obvious that we couldn't really do anything without impacting the architecture. And, and the architecture uh, was intentionally uh, precarious from a seismic point of view. So uh, I said, well, that building really wants to be in Winnipeg. And the only way to bring it to Winnipeg is to remove it, to remove its connection from the ground and disconnect it from the ground so that when there is an earthquake, <coughs> it, it's not uh, beaten up the way uh, buildings normally would be in, in a high seismic zone. So that's where the, the idea of base isolation came from, put the building on jello, essentially, uh, and hope that by changing the energy input from an earthquake into the building in a seismic event, we are going to find that the, build, the structure has enough capacity to survive that, that lower um, uh, energy input. So we, we started modeling and uh, in quite a lot of detail and uh, found that even then, even with the, the base isolation, uh, we couldn't guarantee that the building wouldn't get damaged in an earthquake. We could guarantee that it would survive, that it would not fall on people, uh, but we definitely could not guarantee that the concrete wouldn't crack significantly and get get managed. And given the importance of the building architecturally, uh, we made the decision that we, if we're going to take that step and invest in a, in a seismic uh, upgrade of the building, we're going to do it in such a way that guarantees its, uh, its life uh, in, in the very long term. So this is the reason that, that we, uh, we, we found out that these, the uh, rebar detailing was insufficient in the joints. Um, and that uh, uh, there were some issues also even from a gravity point of view with, with the seismic excitation. So uh, as, as Nick explained, the, the main elements that you see are of course the, uh, the U-shaped beams which span side to side. 
Uh, but as you pointed out, when the spans get up to 120 or 160 feet, uh, they deflect too much. So uh, Bo Boliki introduced those link beams, which run from the higher uh, and shorter span to the wall that connects to the, uh, the rest of the building. And so to, you know, to base isolate the structure, we also have to base isolate the support of the link beam on the left-hand side of that section there. And uh, so that, that beam is actually going to be cut out and base isolated uh, from, from the original building. So uh, this will only be the second structure in Canada that is base isolated, because only school was the first. Yeah, there's quite a bit more of it in, in the US and places like New Zealand and so on, but in Canada it's going to be uh, only the second. So it's going to be a very interesting site to, to watch. So the, there are a number of types of base isolators. The type that we used is uh, basically a big rubber disc that has a, a lead core in the middle to absorb uh, energy. And the building, uh, through a design earthquake, is going to move about a foot, about 300 millimeters, so it's going to sway very, very slowly in an earthquake. Uh, so it's quite, quite a cool concept. We went through a series of studies to see what we could do to save the original building. And it was, um, it was uh, this is one of the sketches where we can speak off this. When you isolate the building, you know, the great hall, you have to isolate it from the rest of the structure and from the ground, from the ground also, wherever they touch. And uh, we looked at uh, all kinds of schemes. There's a, 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 a Link beams, you know, the dark line of climbing up. The one first thought, early thought, was to put a steel plate there to uh, beef, up, beef up the link beams because they weren't sufficient. And, and, uh, and there was another thought at one time to build the last uh, U frame that's shown here to put two columns into the Great Hall, which is uh, no one really liked. We didn't like it, no one liked it. And uh, so we had to work on how to not do that. And so the next thought was we see the steel, the dark gray uh, beam stepping off the last channel to the rest of the building. That the, the last beam is really part of the wall that's gone below. And, uh, and that, was, you know, that thing is about a foot plus. You know, in fact, and, you know when we started this, we said, you know, our ambition, our goal was that when we leave the site, we should feel as if we were never there. And, and, and so we were committed to that. So all these things were intrusions to that completely. And they just didn't, you know, we were getting more and more sad as we went through it. And then uh, Eric and his team pulled off a, a, a very nice, uh, a uh, bit of engineering and thought like with the last with the wall, the top of the wall that I thought was cut off six feet off that top of that wall and turn it into a beam. So when the building moves, the whole thing moves and you don't you don't see any of the stuff that we have in there. That cleaned the whole thing up. And that was you know and that was really uh, a massive stroke. But also, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, the, it, it sort of it was the impetus in a way to take the whole thing down and rebuild it. Because it's the only way that we could really be true to what was there before. So that was the, that's most of our work right now. I mean, you know, the team has been on this thing for five years right now. And there's been a lot of discoveries and, and everything, you know, it's good for the client, you know, because they were paying for this. You know. And that's the, the good thing about the client, too, they are what this building is about. And that's, without that, we don't, we don't have anything. Uh, you know, and the, and the other thing that added to this study, when we scanned the columns, you know, the original drawing stated that the columns were solid. They were hollow. And that, uh, when, you know, the, 
the falling room in an earthquake means that it might have fallen before the earthquake. So this is one of the columns when you took them down. And you look at it, you know, two layers of two lines of steel, some of them weren't even engaged on the inside. So this thing was really you know, living a pretty you know, tenuous life. No one knew it, and there was no record of it that we could find. So the rebuild, it was, um, it's a new direction, but it was, there was optimism in that. In the, all the all the accoutrements that we needed to step in and are gone, and the structure can get to the pureness of what it was. And if you, it's the, it was the poetic structural design, <laughs> yeah, and the Arthur image. So we, uh, so the, all our efforts since then have been in that, and it was really much of a shoring, you know, because we had to shore the columns you know, to to, to uh, build the the whole building sits on. Uh, all the columns sit on the beam that ends up in the circulates the building. And so the columns of the beam, and there's the, we've got a crawl space on that. So, so there's a crawl space that this column, the beam sits in on isolators. And, and the, the slabs also sit on isolators. So the whole thing is dancing together. And uh, so it's, so that whole process was really what drove much of the, you know, the, how, how it would be built and, and uh, put together again. So the only, the only thing then you know, we had uh, to look to have the movement between the building, and this is a big, big, big architectural uh, thing that we, that we were involved in. This was made most of our work, and it was really how do you separate the, the building from the rest of the museum, the back wall, and, uh, and from the ground. And then the separation has to be in the floor, in the roof line, and in, in uh, connection to the wall. We're bringing glass walls into the concrete wall. So how do you isolate that? Uh, we won't have enough time in the next week to tell you what happened. But for that, <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of, lot of work with uh, a heck of a lot of detailed drawings to solve the problem. But our whole objective even in that was to not show them, to conceal the, the movement joints. They only become apparent if there's an earthquake, so which, if it doesn't happen, you won't know. Like that one on the floor as you come down the ramp, on the left, that's, you know, we have a carpet floor there, and there are two steel plates that will slide over each other. Where the carpet sits on the, on the plate, so the bands for that. And then the other uh, important thing when you're doing isolators on the floor is that you have to take a new uh, museum, you know, so people can exit in you know, a problem, so you can get out to the exit routes. And then the roof, all the flashing and all that had to uh, take care of the movement, the potential movement. The movement was going to be up to about 1.2 inches in any direction, any direction. And so uh, those are the, that's a, the design detail, you know, the architects in the room can realize what that involves. And it's, it's, you know, it's a bit, uh, uh, well, it's interesting, but it's also intense. It gets a bit onerous after a while. Uh, and uh, so this, this is a floor plan that shows you that yellow shows you the you know, points of isolation at the floor. So uh, the map wall that you saw in those other photos, <coughs> it's an isolates from the O'Brien gallery to the right and the rest of the building. And then the outside line isolates it from the ground. So we, you know, the, in the basement of the crawl space, you have a wall floating outside that is uh, retaining wall to the earth. And then the isolators would slide, slide over the land. But the green, you know, the pebble beach, the uh, uh, gravel beach and all that goes right over that. So you don't, you don't know they're there unless you happen to stand on them on the floor. when the earthquake happens. Because there's a you know, cavity you know, below 14 inches. So those, those are the things that made the job. But it's fascinating, but it's also uh, takes a lot of time. 
There's a lot of effort by a whole bunch of people. And this is a section, so you can see a, a crawl space, the isolators on footings, and the, they have a main forest plant that spans across all that. And this is an architectural strap that lies on top of that. It's the building has rate changes. And we're using that architectural uh, 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 space between the two for mechanical, to bring mechanical to the exterior of the building with the diffusers. So. And, and, and the new beam uh, at the back, you can see the isolators behind it won't cut off the sit top six feet of the wall to put a, a, the new beam on there. So actually the building really would be quite good then because they look more like a beam rather than top of wall that we're tying into. And that, that top and it, that beam is a new is going to be poured in place and it sits on two plates. That's why Thomas is the place that I was glad on. And uh, but we had to, you know, to report to the two double T's that are standing across at the back that, that have to be supported. So steel beams have been done. That's all being done now. The other things that we have to deal with is the uh, vertical glazing and the skylights. The vertical glazing was um, quite interesting actually. We worked with Eric on that. And it, it was um, it was like going to school, you know, because uh, they modeled this thing for us to see what would happen in an earthquake with those because the columns will move because this is the slender uh, dimension of the columns, so they're gonna move. And they um, looked at the impact of that and then they gave the gradation how much they'll move on each panel of glass. And, uh, and we're changing, we're upgrading the glass. I, they, we want to go change it because it's in design with the glass fence and all that. And they, they said, well, we could probably do without. I said, well, yeah, why not? That makes the more museum even more transparent, which is the objective. So, because the, the thin call, the thin uh, stiffness of their main forest plate, they were like three lands and they were, you know, so you see green fins, they compete with each other. So it would be nothing. So the full transparency happens. Uh, and uh, so basically the glass before, this one, this is there before, it was hanging from the uh, root channel beam, and then the stiffness provided, and I thought the wind uh, loading up. Uh, the new one, the, the corner um, class, is going to cantilever from the column, and then from the both columns, and meet at the, at the corner, and at the corner is going to be a steel rod hanging from the ceiling that's going to carry that corner. So there'll be like a double support on the column and that. And that means an awful lot of stiffness, but we don't know if those uh, horizontal uh, and splice plates are gone, none of that's going to happen. And all, we, we try to keep the, the rhythm of all the bronze connectors intact, and we're using bronze again. So it's just, it's going to be just cleaned up a lot and, you know, and, and it'll work better. It'll stand up in the earthquake. There have been some of them. Um, Glass in this in the building is shattered, and it's uh, just tempered glass, and it's like shrapnel everywhere. So, this is all laminated glass, two sheets, and half inch each, yeah, half inch each laminated. So, that's not going to go anywhere. And, and, the, and, the, and the movement in the glass between the sheets is going to be handled in the silicone. So, that's so it should survive. You know, you've been in an earthquake that the uh, glass usually is the first thing to pop. But this one uh, is, is uh, hopefully none of that happens. And it won't go anywhere if it does. And the other, I mean, the other thing is the spotlights. And, and, uh, so that, that pours along with the size plate. That no longer exists anymore. That's the previous one. This is just a and the shape, the size of the slice plates will be about the same size, the six inches square. The other, the, the skylights are the other thing we're dealing with. Uh, the skylights, uh, <laughs> it's 
almost embarrassing to say that original skylights were a single shade of bronze or chrome. And, and the reason that happened, I know is, is that's probably the reason, because you know, that's the way you know, Arthur wanted to free the paint. So he didn't want any secondary structure of flat skylights interrupting the rest of the composition. So the a vaulted skylight sort of disappears. You're more into the sky and the beams are free. And uh, so we're, we're redoing that. And uh, now it's just in the process of, you know, we have some things to deal with, but it'll be a single layer of eight millimeter glass on the outside, it's twin seal beam. And uh, on the inside layer is two eight mil pieces of glass. And it'll be totally 99% UV protected. Uh, so it's going to be quite a different, uh, which the museum complained about quite a bit, because we're getting UV degradation on, on, uh, on uh, and the same, uh, same thing with the vertical glass. So it's all protecting the artifacts. And the other thing about the glass, it's all uh, low iron glass. So the main problem is that you can walk into this because you don't know it's there. So uh, it's very clear. So this pulling is almost non-glazed. You can almost shrink it, which is really, uh, I'm interested to see how it turns out. So that's where we're at right now. And uh, you know, this is the general issue. <laughs> Part way down, you got this, this big uh, machine that was just chewing away at the building and bringing it down surprisingly easily. But, but <laughs> That I, uh, I really enjoy it. <clears throat> it's that, that this is really the true color, the concrete that you saw, because there's no skylights on it. So this is really the color, uh, concrete color which we're trying to have. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, which is, you know, you take it to these degrees, it's not. And, uh, you know, I went there myself one day. I didn't want to play with and it was sad. Because I was glad that there was a study on my <laughs> So, next, uh, we'll see where it's at. There it's gone. Uh, and that's the machine that was chewing it apart. That was when I was taking the top of the wall off. And this is the excavation. You see the gun, gun uh, burst of shells, which, you know, and the gun emplacements are where the turret is, but then these are the burst of shells besides each of the gun emplacements that the house had without ammunition. And there's a tunnel that connected all this, the whole, all three of them are connected. But, uh, there's just one more uh, thing to show. This is roughly what's happening. You know, the, the great hall, the base of it, the columns, of the, you know, the, the, everything from the uh, slab down is part in place. And then everything else is precast. The columns are precast to be set into dowels into the beam that's uh, on the perimeter. And uh, all the channel beams are, are precast also in sections and be spliced on site. But, and this is, it's, it's it's interesting, you know, it's interesting to do it again because now all the stuff that has to be in there, there's going to be conduit incorporated in it, and all the diagonal beams, this drainage from the roof comes down with diagonal beams. So it's really, uh, you know, it's still a tricky joint when they get to the uh, diagonal beam location where everything comes together, and then the whole thing is post tension, which is, uh, a whole other interesting story that might be a bit long, but you know, one of Eric's, one of the young fellows he had working on it, I was curious about how the structure was really working. And, and he said that the, big, uh, the hardest working columns are the shortest, shortest ones, because everything's coming down that way. And then there's that big beam on the top. And you know, the, the post tension does another thing that's quite interesting. It sort of almost I'm not sure if I'm saying this right here, but it releases the weight of the beam and puts it into compression at the end of the column, at the beam. So the, the rebuilding it 
allow us to really use high strength concrete to be able to do that and really take that road. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Splicing on the site, and that's where the link beams help um, to hide the splice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The link beams are forward on the site. They're the cast in place, same as the, the big beam at the back where the wall is the big way. So, so, that will, uh, so that's how it's done. And then the nice thing about that is you know, we're, we're allowing for some decent drainage on the, on the but that's all we need cast in the free cast shop. We're going to cast right into the beam so it's easy to move And we're insulating the top of the paint also. Okay, it's good to have that thing before. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yes? Um, two things. I think it's very impressive. Thank you for, uh, for that. We, we love the building. We see it return to the same uh, dimension. The, uh, the isolators, have they been, you mentioned they've been used in, in uh, New Zealand, I believe. Uh, so two questions. Has there been a seismic event where the isolators are in place, and what was the result? And number two is, uh, I guess for the, engineer, for the engineers, is this new design, which doesn't look cheap, is it designed for a worst case scenario? Uh -huh. Nine point whatever, whatever the regular scale? Yeah, I think, I think the, the main structure that was designed to a one in 2,475 year event. So that's up, it's beyond the codes, the current codes. The codes were, have been going up obviously since the 70s. But uh, that's what it's designed for. But all the roofing and all those other components like the, uh, the roofing membranes and all that have to work to one uh, 475 year event. So it's, it's beyond the current code. Yes. Um, about the, the uh, question about testing, testing those isolators, um, I happened to be in Christchurch in February of 2011 in their brand new art gallery, and um, I believe it was designed to that uh, seismic uh, standard. And um, I mean, um, at the time of the earthquake, I was in the bookshop. Books and um, the problem there was the false ceiling was falling down and the standing, all the books were flying down, but in the main building it was intact. And the doorway, the vestibule, the glass shattered, but they and eventually the you elite know, survived and it was terrifying, but the whole thing was like being on a, a boat at the B and E that boat and uh, anyway uh, upshot was they ended up making that their controls that part of the LD as their control center for the whole um, uh, rescue operation. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was a 6.0 earthquake, but it was very shallow, so it had a huge impact. <laughs> Say a couple of things about the you know, the it's upwards of three seconds. Yeah, because of the the period that the movement would happen is what up to three seconds, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a different motion. It's just like you know much much gentler, and that's why you know you can get away with doing all the other stuff. It's not you know the jarring effect. It's a shock of the in essence. <laughs> so um, you said it's designed 
or a one in front of them or something like that? Well, that's the, what the roofing is. Like the main structure is one in 2,400 or something like that. So can you guys say that in terms of is it designed for a 9.0 or can you put it in those terms? Do a snap? So we can yeah, you can. You can. But you won't be around in 475 years. No, but it could happen tomorrow. Okay. Chris, so that's a trick. <laughs> so do you know what it would withstand in terms of the Richter scale? Uh, well, it's a... Uh, the point of the base isolation is oh. to take away the sun motion and disconnect it from the building. So the building itself is designed for a much, much lower motion than that. But the ground uh, in Vancouver is a heavy work of that number of people. Mm. Yeah, we worked on a house in California with a client who wanted a Richter 8 house. <laughs> it was on the top of the hill, so it was designed as a stiff thing that you know, if everything gave away, the house would slide and tap right down the hill. <laughs> Well, um, I'm hoping to finish by next summer because, you know, we're, the, the museum has been put under a lot of stress. This is their uh, <clears throat> important space for them and, uh, uh, because they do a lot of their events and talks and stuff like that. They don't have a theater right now. So this is important to them. So the revenue, just the interest of the right there. And so we felt that, but it took this time. But, uh, we, we, we try to push it as hard as we can. We've got a good builder on board now. Are you doing any upgrades to the rest of the, the complex or are you just the Great Hall? Uh, I know other places aren't up to it either. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't know when that will happen. It's funding, it's funding. Really. And, and that's not, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, into that yet. And, and you know, because the, you know, some of it's, you know, the rest of the structure is quite, you know, especially the back, the storage is on like a parking garage. It's double T's sitting on a beam on a column. And I think it's been already upgraded a certain amount of the footings and foundations. So there's some help being done, but uh, still, it's tenuous. But it's still, yeah. <laughs> this is This is because of its height and it was kind of, yeah. I was, um, so the idea is that the glass won't break, uh, so it's not guaranteed. Well, it's not guaranteed. So but if the thing simply breaks, it won't come down, this is why it stays in place, it won't shatter. That's the advantage. Because yeah, you don't want to get hit, get hit by a one-inch one piece of glass. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you're going to have the Richter Center for the Arts. I did. Yeah. I imagine with all of the new glass that's coming in, without all the seams, that the artifacts will appear more like part of the landscape. Well, you know, the, the clear glass and all that will make, you know, sort of get closer to the setting of those pieces being outdoors. Mm -hmm. So you get the natural light on them. And, and that's, I think, was the intention when we thought of a greenhouse. You know, but. Uh, But there's also renovation of the landscape happening too, right? I didn't, I didn't know. Is there a better renovation to the landscape? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I should have included that. Because that was part of the statement of significance that the landscape has to be kept as you know as it was or and improved. Because even Cornelian when she's doing the landscape, she sees the landscape as an evolving thing. It's not a fixed thing. And that right now there's a, a, a landscape architect, they're all Italian farms. <clears throat> At present, they're doing a statement of significance with the greater lands, and they're not in serious con collaboration with the Muscle. So that's going to take work on time, and whatever happens here, and adding to what was there, what we find that. And that was an important, you know, and actually, even with the mound, which is a I didn't mention that in the beginning, when, when, you know, when you go down, so 
a, a pond and all that, but also wanted to feel like part of the ocean. So he never, he always used mouths so the water goes around the mouth. He doesn't, he doesn't like it in a tank, you know. Mm. So it feels like it's moving, it's natural. Yes. I was wondering if you could speak a little to uh, the execution of the excavation mm. and the demolition, the specifications that have to be written for that, if any anything special was considered, or was that left to a consultant or the GC themselves? Well, there's a list of, uh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I have two people here with me that are taking care of the building right now, and Jim Ross are uh, Pete and Sam, so people can, she's the project architect, and she's taking care of the job. <laughs> She does all the work and I go around to give talks. <laughs> no, uh, no, she's, uh, we've been colleagues for 30 years. And Anne's had some serious experience on other projects with high detail and all that. And uh, when we were going from this interview for the project at UBC, we had the opportunity and I introduced uh, the players. And I said, Anne's going to be our uh, project architect. Uh, I said, if she's so fastidious, sometimes she drives me crazy. <laughs> well, she is, she takes care of business, and uh, so maybe she could, I don't know if you guys can tackle that question. Can I repeat that question? <laughs> I was just wondering about the process of the demolition, because it sounds like it had to be taken, uh, it had to be considered with so much care to leave the, the rest of the building in place and intact and it had to be surgical it seems like and I would imagine that specifications and drawings would have been far more onerous than uh, your average because it's not just your back to shell condition but this is a very particular building. The sequencing of the demolition had um, um, it was all engineered by the demolition um, trade actually but it, it was taken down it, it was like a domino they, they started with the highest and and they would they would have um they take the the, the the highest beam and, and and then take the link beams and then it, it was all sequenced and orchestrated and what's very very important is uh we have um vibration monitoring set up to make sure that the artifacts in the museum um, are not impacted with any of the vibration. And we also have um, a movement monitoring of the existing structure, so to make sure that things uh, there's no major damage or movement in, in the rest of the structure. Yeah. yeah and that was probably, you know, because all those conditions were on, whoever was going to do it, so that really drove how they do the demolition. Thank you. <laughs> 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 